Jim Richards, I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. I, I, we're going to be talking about the unseen kingdom or the invisible kingdom. You know, it's an amazing thing that uh, our comprehension of God, our, uh, our interpretation of scriptures, the way we relate to the word of God, relies on us being able to see the unseen. Now, I talked about this last week. This is, this is so very important. You know, the Bible provides a record of people who were able to endure incredibly difficult circumstances and situations because they learned to see the unseen. And now, the only way you can see the unseen is with the eye of the heart. But more and more and more and more and more, the struggle that we face is that we have become totally dependent on our five senses, which means that we can't see the unseen because we haven't trained ourselves to. You know, I have a, I have a dog that I, that's about seven years old, and uh, he's called a black mouth cur. Now, a black mouth cur is a really interesting dog because actually they're as far as I know, they're the only true American breed dog that there is. And the cur, the blackmouth cur, was actually bred in uh, Louisiana. And uh, uh, it was bred to be really strong, powerful, tenacious, and vicious. And um, uh, they, were, they were bred to hunt wild boar and bear. Well, if you're gonna hunt wild boar and bear, uh, one of your character traits has to be that you don't back down. Now, the interesting thing about, the, about these black mouth curs, incredibly intelligent dogs, uh, <clears throat> but uh, you, you can't intimidate them. And, and when they're puppies and you're training them, you can't make them do anything. Because remember, they're bred to be tenacious. You're going up against a bear. You, you can't back down. You can't let fear enter into the picture. So, so when they enter into a conflict, uh, they will die pretty much before they'll quit. And, and particularly, by the way, if they're protecting, if they're protecting their master, their family, their, you know, you know, their, 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 their pack, they'll die before they'll quit. And so when people get curs, they usually don't know what they're getting. When people get curs, uh, they, if they're ignorant about training dogs, then what they try to do is they try to make the dog do things. Now, when you try to make a black mouth cur do anything, it is in his nature or her nature to come against you harder because that's what that man that is what their that's their DNA that's that's how they survive uh, when they're hunting and doing the things that they were that they were bred to do, and so so most people that get them actually give them up. So you know I discovered I discovered very early on that I could not make him do anything, but I could train him to do anything. So one of, the, one of the things that I've done to make him a safe dog is when I, t you know, when I first started walking him, I would make him heal. I'd make him stay right beside me. I'd make him do all the things that you're supposed to do. But one of the things that happens when, when, you, when you walk a dog and you, keep, you make him heal, you make him stay right there, then, then the problem is he's not exploring very much. He's really not getting to function like a dog. So basically, I developed about four or five commands that as long as he obeyed these commands, I could put him on a, on a retractable long leash and I would let him sniff and smell and do all the things that dogs do when I would take him out for a walk as long as he obeyed those commands. Now, if he ever got to where he got slack on it, then I brought him back up, made him walk right beside me, did all those things. Now, my goal in doing this was, was to make him safe. You know, with a dog, if you don't let a dog sniff and, and, and use their other, in, their other senses and they start relying totally on their eyes, those are the dogs that will bite you because, because everybody's bigger than they are. You know, when a human stands over them, they, uh, you, you know, they, they, it's, a, they, it's a dominating size figure that's standing over them. But mainly by, uh, by 
losing touch with their sense of smell and losing touch with whatever their intuitive senses are that, that dogs have, <coughs> excuse me, that dogs have, then, then they rely on their eyes. And so when they rely on their eyes, they're very easily intimidated. And so a dog that has been taught to just rely on his eyes and not allowed to sniff and smell and not being trained properly and, and having the kind of communication that has a, a strong intuitive influence in it, that dog gets dangerous. And, uh, and, and with a dog as vicious as a cur can be, you don't want that dog uh, just relying on his eyes and getting intimidated and, and, and jumping on somebody or jumping on, on, on another animal. Well, that's kind of what's happened to us, to the human race. God gave us all of these capacities. You know, I was, I was thinking about it today. You know, how that, uh, uh, you know, uh, with all the things that have been going on in, in the world with the coronavirus and all this kind of stuff, you know, I was thinking about the fact that, that uh, uh, really there was a time when people pretty much intuitively knew what to do when they got sick. But, but we stopped trusting our intuitive ability. You know, the first thing man did was he stopped, he, he stopped trusting his ability to hear and recognize the voice of God. And then over time, he stopped trusting in uh, his uh, intuitive ability. And, you know, and little by little by little, we gave up our interaction with the world around us, with the invisible world around us, and really with the invisible realm of God, the spiritual realm. And we became re reliant on our eyes and on our five senses. And so we become like this powerful uh, dog that, ha that is strong, that can be vicious. Uh, and, and really, we become incredibly dangerous because we are totally reliant on our flesh. You know, it's amazing. You talk to Christians today about the flesh, and, and they get so goofy with it. They get so far out and mystical with it that, you know, they forget that the flesh is just the flesh. It's these five, it's these five senses um, that we start uh, allowing to guide our life, to, to fulfill these five senses, to let these five senses be the, the judging factors in our lives. And before long, we live in the flesh. We relate to this world around us. We relate to the people around us based on what we can see and hear and taste and touch and feel. And actually, when you, when you think about the flesh, it doesn't really just stop with those five senses because the Apostle John says that all that's in the world, and when he says that, he's talking about the world system. All that's in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, that's, that, that's these five senses, and the pride of life. That's the ego that you hear me, hear me talk about so very, very much. So we are relating, we are supposed to be spiritually minded believers, but the real truth is we relate to everything around us based on what the Bible calls the flesh. Now, sadly, we try to make everything that the Bible teaches us about God fit into uh, these, these, these carnal, this carnal mind that's based on these five senses. This means that this means that really we lose touch with the with the uh, eternal things of God. We lose touch with with uh, the miraculous of God. We lose touch with uh, 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 with God in general and all that's possible through God because we start relating to Him based on these five senses. And, and once we do that, we interpret Scripture in a way that makes sense to us based on these five senses. Now you know. This week, is, this week is Easter weekend, and we're talking about the resurrection from the dead. And, you know, sadly, when we think about the resurrection from the dead, for most of us, we're just thinking about the resurrection of a physical body. But the, the real truth is, uh, if, if we just see Jesus being resurrected just in, in, a, in a natural, physical sense, then, then we really lose everything that the resurrection is really about. And we lose this capacity to see then into, into a spiritual realm, if you will, and comprehend all the things that God has given for us, all the things that, that He's done for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, God exists in a realm that is outside of heaven and earth. 
The heavens speaks of this realm that we would call the universe. The earth, of course, re refers to this planet. Now, there's, yes, there's all planets. There's, so, there's other uh, solar systems and galaxies in, in the heavens, and I understand that. But the Bible focuses its attention on the heavens in general and in the earth. That's why I always tell people there's two phases to creation. There's creating this realm that, that matter can exist in, but, there, so, but it starts with the realm. How is that realm designed? And therefore, how does time, space, and matter fit into that realm? Well, God himself exists outside of the realm of time, space, and matter. But the problem is we have trained ourselves. We've given up all of our intuitive and spiritual senses, and we have trained ourselves to interpret everything that exists in light of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, based on, based on what these five senses tell us and how that calculates in, in our ego. And so, and so when you... When you force God to fit into your concepts based on time, space, and matter, then the problem is you can't renew your mind so that you can see something that's bigger and greater and beyond time, space, and matter. You know, uh, I, I, just did a, I just did a special video not too long ago where I talked about the promises of God. And... Uh, uh, and our struggle with being able to trust the promises of God. And my sister really, she brought up, brought up a really interesting point. And, um, and, you know, she was talking about her struggle when she was young because of other people uh, throughout her life making promises that they didn't keep. And she could pinpoint it to a particular promise that happened uh, that you know, that the person who made the promise did not fulfill and how that basically as a child, you know, she just reached this idea or this feeling, this belief that promises are just something people say they're going to do, but it's probably never going to happen. And so, and so as a child, you develop this concept that a promise, of course, is something that somebody makes today and at some time in the future, they might fulfill that promise based on their character and the nature. Now, even that within itself, that's logical. I mean, you know, that is completely logical, and it's completely logical when you're thinking about promises as they relate to yourself and other people. But you know something? That is not at all logical when you're relating to a God who exists outside of time, space, and matter. You know, we lose. We, we, we totally let go of the reality um, that there is no yesterday and there is no tomorrow with God. When, when God talks to us about remembering something that happened yesterday or Him saying He will remember something, He, he is communicating within the framework of what we have the capability to understand. But the real truth is for Him, it doesn't exist the way that it exists for us. In other words, God is never having to remember something that happened yesterday which really means he is never really promising something that's going to happen tomorrow because in the realm where God lives, there is no time, space, and matter. That means there is no yesterday. There is no tomorrow. There's only right now. And Jesus talked about this. Jesus challenged the, uh, the Jewish religious leaders about this. You know, whenever he started talking about Abraham and, and whenever he started talking about the I am principle, God is the I am. He's not the I was. He's not the I'm going to be. He is the I am. And this is, you know, Paul talked about this where he said, you know, today, right now is the day of salvation. There isn't a, there isn't a tomorrow as far as God is concerned because with God, there is only right now. There's only today. So, <clears throat> You know, I think about this kind of, and I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you about, as much as I can, about the resurrection of Jesus and, about, and what this has to do with the resurrection of Jesus and how that we've got to come to see who God is. We've got to come and see the, the finished work of Jesus in something that we haven't reduced down to our finite, intellectual, ego-driven uh, uh, concepts. Now, <clears throat> when you think about a promise of God, when when a person makes a promise. It is exactly as my sister shared. 
that person makes that promise, and then based on their character and their memory and you know, all these other factors, at some time in the future, they will either keep that promise or break that promise. Now, that can't really apply to God on a, for a lot of reasons, but on a certain level, you have to understand if there is no future, then God is not making a promise today that he will at some time in the future bring to pass. And it's important that you see this. Man, if you want to remember, you know, this series, by, by the way, I'm changing one word in the title of this series. You know, we were originally calling this Miraculous Probabilities, uh, moving from, from possibility to probability to absolute assurance. Well, you know what? I'm changing that absolute assurance. I'm changing it to certainty. Moving from possibility to probability to certainty. And the reason I'm doing it is because I think certainty makes more sense, and that's really what faith is. Faith is certainty. Now, the more you understand about who God is, the more you understand about how God functions, the more you move from His promises being possible to His promises being probable to His, pro to his promises being certain. In other words, there is no question in your mind about whether they're going to happen or not. Now, I was looking at this scripture. I, I love this scripture. I, I don't know how many years I've studied this scripture, pondered this scripture, meditated on all of the many different concepts about this scripture. But Isaiah 46 talks about God, and Isaiah 46 talks about God saying that declaring the end from the beginning and the ancient times uh, things that are not yet. Now, God declaring the end from the beginning in reality is the only way God can declare anything. See, when we think about God declaring something, we just think, about, okay, he's going he's to tell us right now what this outcome is going to be in the future. Uh, well, it's really, it's really more than that when it comes to his promises. Now, don't use this to get over into, into everything being predetermined, predestination, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but with God, you want to understand something. If, if God says, I'm just going to make this up, so, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to grab its straws to explain something that is beyond human comprehension. But if, I, I'll give you a good example. A friend of mine, Betty Baxter, who I, I would imagine has gone on to be with the Lord. I haven't seen her uh, in quite a long time. And Betty was a really close friend uh, to um, Brenda and me. She was a close friend to Impact Ministries. She ministered here in our church. Uh, I, I, I love Betty. And Betty her, has the test, one of the most significant healing testimonies of anybody, I think, in the last hundred years. And Betty was a complete cripple, bowed over and uh, as a child. And so the Lord spoke to her and her mother and said, I, I believe it was in the fall, you're, you're gonna, you will be healed. Now, many people struggle with why, why did God say he was waiting to the fall? Let me tell you something. Any, any of the time that it takes for God to accomplish something good in our lives, is never because uh, he's waiting for some big spiritual timing. It's always because of what it takes for us in our heart to, to take hold of something. And so, and so Betty and her mother both had heard from God that in the fall, I believe it was, uh, that, that, she was going to, that she was going to get healed. Now, so in our minds, that would, to fit into this temporary time-space continuum that we have going on here, then that would mean, okay, God has made me this promise. So the big question now, can I trust God to be faithful to keep his word? Well, if there is no time where God is, then... In God's experience, that healing has already taken place. 
The problem is in our experience, we haven't taken hold of that healing yet, but God can't get any more faithful to giving that healing than he is when he says it. So when God says it, in fact, in eternity, it is already done. Now, when we read about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, when we read about the things that, that, we, that we have in him, uh, there are still people who think that the resurrection and the new covenant is sort of like the old covenant where, where it's a promise of something that will happen in the future. But the truth is, through the resurrection, every promise of God became fulfilled for us. Now, I, I, I really a, a pastor that I really loved, a really, a really good friend of mine, he, he, you know, he, he talked about this and he said, it's sort of like having a bank account in heaven where God deposits everything that you're ever going to need in this bank account. He said, now, as you're going through this life, if you trust God, you're constantly making withdrawals from that account because in your time of need, you see that God's already met that need. He said, the last thing in the world he would ever want to do would be get to heaven and have money in his bank account. Well, that's the way a lot of us are going to be. We're going to get there and go, what? I, you, you mean this has been here for me all the time? See, we think we're waiting on God to do something. The real truth is God has already done it. The Bible says, I've shared this with you before, in the book of uh, um, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it says, faith is a substance of things hoped for. That, con that word, things, there, is things, <coughs> excuse me, that have already been accomplished. Now, everything, I, I got this, I got a message from somebody one time. They said, they said, I don't know why all you preachers keep calling, you know, what Jesus did at the cross a finished work. It's not a finished work if I've got to do something, you know, to get it, or if I've got to do something to make it happen. Well, that's the problem. You're not having to do something to make it happen. It is a finished work. And, and, it's when you believe that it is a finish. That's what faith is. Faith believes that what Jesus accomplished through the cross has absolutely been done. It is not going to be done. Now, by the way, let me just mention this to you. In this series of Miraculous Probability, I hope you'll get this series because I'm telling you, we're going to go into more details about how to move into this, into working with and connecting to this invisible realm than we can go into here. I'm going into weeks and weeks and weeks of this here on this, on this broadcast uh, just so that I can give you stuff here that you're not even going to get on the series. I'm trying to make sure you get everything that you want. But, and I want you to know that every time you purchase a series, not only do you make a, an investment in yourself, but that gives us resources to reach around the world. We, we are involved in what we call Operation One Billion, where we are raising up one billion uh, disciples unto the Lord Jesus around the world. And every time you invest in yourself, you invest in helping us reach a billion people around the world. Now, let me jump back into this here. Um, so, so let's just, let's just kind of look at a few of these, uh, a few of these concepts where it is absolutely important that we, um, that we realize that we're not trying to believe for God to do something, but the reality of it is we are trying to decide if we believe God has already done what he said. You know, Mark 11, 22 through 24, you know, we have the whole thing where Jesus taught us about mountain moving faith. And uh, so, so, you know, he goes through really what it, in, in verse uh, 23 was basically a description of, of the faith of God, how God operated faith and created the world. But, but 24 brings you to something really interesting. He says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things that you ask, now that's a different word for things, when you pray, now keep in mind, the word ask, almost always in the Greek, the word translated as ask is a, is a word that says you're asking for something that you know has been given. You're not asking for something that you don't know what the answer is. And it's not just, a, it's not just that you're trying to get the right answer, it's that you're asking for something that's already yours, it's already been given. So it says, so whatever things you ask for when you pray, 
believe that you have received uh, receive them. So everything about faith and the new covenant is based on believing what has been accomplished, not what will be accomplished. And it says, if you, it says when you believe that you have received them, when you believe they've already been given, that's, that's why you're asking, then, then you, shall, you shall have them, you shall receive them. That word receive means take hold, and then you'll be able to take hold of them in, in your heart. You know, in Matthew 18, 19, really interesting place here, it's, he says, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything uh, that they shall ask, there's that word ask, that you, you're asking why? Because it's already been given, it's already been made available to you. But what's interesting, that particular Greek word there is things that have been accomplished. How many times have we approached God and really the way we're approaching God in our heart is really unbelief because we're saying, I, I'm, I'm coming to see if you will do this. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus was raised from the dead after having become all of the curse of the law. This means that everything that could go wrong in my life, everything that has ever gone wrong in my life, Jesus became that. You know, he became the meningitis I had when I was a child. He became the broken back that I had. He became the broken tailbone that I had. He became the, you know, the ruptured. He became, he became all of that. And in order for Jesus to be raised from the dead, he had to conquer that. Everything that, everything that I would ever have to face, everything you would ever have to face, everything that anybody in the world would ever have to face. So, we're not going to him saying, Jesus, will you go die again? And, and will, you, will you take care of this for me? We're going to him saying, Jesus, I believe what the Bible says about you, that you became the curse. You bore my sickness. You bore my disease. You bore my sorrow. You bore my heartache. You bore all of these things. And when you were raised from the dead, you already conquered them, which means whatever I'm facing now has already been conquered. And the question is, do I believe it's already been conquered through your death, burial, and resurrection, or do I believe it's going to? Well, you know what? That all gets into, am I looking at the world? Am I looking at God? Am I looking at the promises of God through these natural senses that limit God to time, space, and matter? Or am I looking at God as the creator who exists in this other realm? Where when, when he says it, 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 it's not a promise he will keep. When he says it, it's something he's already done because there is no tomorrow with God. There, there is only today. I hope you're enjoying this. Man, send this to people that are discouraged. Share this with people. Share your comments. And, and I'm telling you, make this journey with me, and I'll talk to you again next week.